Good morning, everybody. I welcome to you to the session online child sexual exploitation risk and response this morning. I'm very glad to see so many faces, familiar and non-familiar people uh, coming to this session, which is a joint cooperation of several organizations around the world that are dealing with the problem of online child sexual exploitation. <coughs> We, we know so far that uh, at least one third of the users of the internet worldwide is under the age of 18. Uh, when it comes to developing countries, it's more or less 50% probably. So we know that many young people and especially also young children are using the internet. They are facing uh, heinous crimes uh, when being online. Their images are produced and put online and we will hear from the excellent speakers around the panel how the situation is in various countries. In the first round, we are setting the scene of the problem. And then in the second round, we will speak about res responses to the problem or probably solutions from the technical side as well as from the legislation side. I will introduce the speakers when it's their turn to speak. So uh, let me start first with Anjan Rose to my left side, who is representing UNICEF here on the panel. He has long-standing experience in child protection issues, has been working for several years with ECPAT International, and he will first start with his statement. Anjan, it's your turn. Uh, thank you very much, Jutta, and uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. Uh, I will start by saying uh, that, you know, unlike some of the other issues that you may be um, listening to at the IGF. This session uh, deals with a very serious uh, issue that we all have to come together. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is because we are talking about um, something um, very, very serious uh, related to children, uh, the sexual abuse and exploitation of children facilitated by digital technologies or online. And uh, the reason why we are here is to speak about not only the issue itself. Uh, I will be followed by uh, Susie Hargis from Internet Watch Foundation, who will give you a little bit more details on the extent uh, of which uh, children are uh, facing these um, really uh, damaging consequences and uh, what we are seeing in terms of technology facilitated crimes against them. Uh, we know children around the world uh, are, as Juta mentioned, are in, you know, accessing technology, either they are accessing themselves or they are being influenced uh, by the use of technology. And when we say that, uh, it's the production uh, of child sexual abuse imagery uh, that is then distributed uh, through uh, the online uh, medium. And with the advancements of technology, we know the encryption um, and uh, you know, the ease of access, the ease of storage has really compounded the problem for law, en law enforcement world over. And this is such a serious challenge that uh, back uh, you know, into what we have seen over the years is uh, the, the increase in the volume, the severity of the crimes against children, children as low as you know, in their womb, in mother's womb are being you know, photographed through sonar, through ultrasound, in anticipation of the baby being born so that they can be abused. And this really paints a very gruesome picture of the world that we are living in now. And um, just to, you know, to uh, say that um, the volume of these uh, images uh, is becoming unmanageable, the severity of the crimes become, you know, really uh, horrendous, uh, the world came together um, in 2012 as a global attempt uh, within the Global Alliance uh, to, uh, Against Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation was, you know, there was this uh, initiative between the European Commission and U.S. Uh, Attorney General uh, where um, 48 member states came together to take very concrete actions. And s some of the pr core principles of those um, actions were to... Um, you know, 
have clear um, methods of identifying victims and providing reintegration and support services for them. Uh, very clear messages for offenders, uh, improving the capacity of law enforcement to detect online crimes and to find the offenders, uh, raising awareness globally, um, and removing these child sexual abuse materials from the circulation. So those were the clear four principles on which the Global Alliance uh, started. And then in, two th in 2012, and in 2013, they expanded the membership to 52 countries. In 2014, so championed by David Cameron, the, the then Prime Minister of UK, um, an initiative called We Protect was formed. And that, again, reiterated um, the, the principles that was laid in the, uh, the Global Alliance uh, principle. And uh, that brought together member states, industry, civil society together to take some common action and common goal. And each one of them um, decided to contribute in their own way. And based on that, uh, the We Protect Glo you know, was initiative was formed, which later on in 2016 got merged with uh, the Global Alliance, and now it's called We Protect Global Alliance Against Child Sexual Exploitation Online. Uh, what we are going to do in this session, I mean, I will probably pass on my baton to uh, Susie very soon, but I just wanted to mention that uh, to address sexual exploitation of children online, uh, we have to come up with a very holistic response. It's not a, a problem that only law enforcement can tackle alone. It's not a problem that technology industry can solve alone. It's not a problem that civil society can solve alone. It's a collective effort and it's a global effort. It's, uh, it, it, we know internet spans across the globe. So the response that's required is both at a national level and we will talk about that maybe in the second session where we'll talk about what are the different capabilities that's required from the member states to really address the different issues that overlay uh, a child uh, who is being sexually exploited online and the different mechanisms that's required. Uh, so one of the core outcome of the We Protect Global Alliance was the formation of the Model National Response, which is a guide uh, that helps the member states to take proper action uh, in order to, uh, to fight this issue. And we will also talk about, you know, how, uh, and Susie will talk about the threat assessment, which was launched just, um, you know, recently, um, uh, that paints the picture, you know, where we are in terms of the offending uh, scenario and where, what children are facing. I would also, in the second half, uh, you know, yeah, sorry, I, I'll just uh, mention that this will be launched um, today. We are launching the... Um, uh, the, the Model National Response brochure uh, at the IGF, and I will talk more about this in the second half. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, and Jan, and Dan, for setting the scene for us so far. Uh, you've already referred to the We Protect initiative, and Susie Hargreaves, Chief Executive of the Internet Watch Foundation, will go into that a little bit more in detail. Um, since uh, the Internet Watch Foundation is one of the major players in fighting child sexual abuse imagery and has a role to play in the We Protect initiative as well. So please, Susie, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita, and thank you, Anne Jan, for that introduction about We Protect. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, my name is Susie Hargreaves. I'm the Chief Exec of the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK. And I'm also here, though, in my capacity as a board member of We Protect, an international advisory board member. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the global threat assessment that was commissioned by We Protect. But just before then, uh, to tell you what I do in my day job, the IWF is uh, the UK hotline for reporting and moving online child sexual abuse. And our mission is the uh, elimination of online child sexual abuse. We've been going for 22 years. We're an NGO. We're funded by the internet industry. We have 142 members who include the biggest companies in the world, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google. And it, it, our philosophy is that industry pays to clean up its own networks. And since we started 22 years ago, we've removed over 500,000 web pages, and that equates to millions of images and videos. So to talk to you a bit more about the Global Threat Assessment, 
when we protect was established it was really important that we looked at this as a global issue and we really tried to clarify what the key issues were and what online child sexual exploitation looked like so basically um, the the sort of um, areas that we uh, defined that we protect defined was that uh, CSE, as we call it, child sexual exploitation, can include, but it's not limited to, the production, possession, and distribution of child sexual abuse images and videos. And that's often called CSAM by many of us working in, in the area. It also includes the increasing crime of online grooming of potential child victims with the intention of sexual exploitation. And this includes manipulating and coercing these children into performing sexual acts online. And recently, the biggest threat has been the, the, the massive increase in live streaming of child sexual exploitation and abuse. So in order to highlight a global response to this, due to the global interconnected nature of the internet, um, we protect commissioned um, a global threat assessment and it identified five areas, five vulnerabilities that drive the crime of online child sexual abuse. And the first one is that online child sexual exploitation is the most insidious form of modern cybercrime. As societies continue to be connected uh, via the internet, it's become easier than ever for those who want to sexually exploit children to make contact with potential victims wherever they are in the world. The second area is that developments in technology are increasingly complex and have generated a paradigm shift in the victim's online exposure, but also the offender's ability to share child sexual abuse material securely and to interact anonymously with children and other offenders online. And offenders are now able to leverage technology in a way that never used to happen. And that includes developments in encryption and in hidden services, which are often called dark nets to develop networks of like-minded people on a larger scale than ever before. And to give you an example of our work, about 80% of the content we see on the internet is free, about 20% we class as commercial content, which is behind payment walls. So there are many, many networks and hidden services where like-minded people can come together to share uh, information. And we know one service that has 15,000 registered members where subscribers are required to revalidate their membership monthly by uploading either 20 images or a two-minute video of an infant or toddler being abused. The scale of the issue is growing rapidly. You'll hear us all talk about the volumes. In 2017, the National Center for Exploited and Missing Children, or NECMEC, in the US, they reported a 700% increase in the number of industry referrals of child sexual abuse material between 2013 and 2017. The presence of a video camera on every device and computer has exacerbated the, the issues of live streaming and sextortion. We've seen children as young as three, five years old, on their own, in their bedrooms, clearly being coerced, actually being sexually exploited. The issue is also nobody knows how many images are out there, but we know we are dealing with millions of images and many, many of these are duplicates. The other issue, the fourth issue they've identified within the Global Threat Assessment is that children who are victims of child sexual abuse can be victims from birth up to adulthood. So child sexual abuse spans zero to 17, so under 18. And our recent, most recent report, the IWF's most recent report, we showed that of the 132,000 reports we took in 2017, 55% of the children were aged under 10. And shockingly, I'm going to share with you that we looked at the last three years of data and 65% of the images of children aged 0 to 2 were Category A. Category A in the UK is the worst level, which includes rape and sexual torture. So the younger the child, the worse the level of the abuse. And the final point that was identified is that Research indicates that children who are victims of online child sexual abuse suffer the same repercussions and impact on their lives as children of physical abuse offline as well. And that includes higher rates of social <coughs> isolation, mental health problems, suicide attempts, alcohol, illegal drug dependencies, and the likelihood to be re-victimized later in life. 
And it's really important to remember that every single image is a child who's been really sexually abused, and every time someone looks at that image, they're victimized. And I just want to finish with a story of telling you about some young women I met in the States who had been repeatedly abused in the video shared online. They had been rescued, and they were, uh, they were from the ages of about 14, 15. But one of them, who's in her 20s, said that she had recently had someone come up to her in a supermarket and say he'd identified her from pictures he'd seen offline. And she said to me, I feel physically scared every moment of my life. It does not go away. And it's absolutely essential that we emphasize the need for us all to work together on this issue. Um, this is why the global threat assessment is so important. We all need to step up globally to work together. So thank you so much for listening and look forward to future discussions about solutions. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Susie, for setting the scene for us and explaining a little more in detail. I, I just have one further question. Could you give us some statistics from the Internet Watch Foundation where the children that are depicted in these images come from? Do you have any figures about that? Um, no, we can't provide definitive data about where the children come from. We can, we can provide anecdotal data about the children we see. We obviously do, um, we uh, categorize all the children that we see in terms of um, diversity, age. Mm -hmm. So we can tell you those sort of factors. What we can tell you is where the content is hosted. So the content, less than 0.3% of the content we saw last year is hosted in the UK, uh, whereas some other countries, and I know the Netherlands is going to speak later on, Netherlands, the US, Canada, particularly high hosting rates. Um, we are seeing as more uh, people come online around the world, we're seeing a slight shift in the, in the children that we're seeing. So for instance, we have a reporting portal in India, and we're starting to see children who look like they are from an Indian heritage. So actually, uh, we are seeing that people are actually uh, demanding children that they, that they want to see. So mm -hmm. it's, it's quite early to say, but anecdotally we can sort of give you some indication. Okay, thank you. So I would now like to turn to Aisha Sheridi. I hope I pronounced your now name well. She um, has a university degree in international relationship, working now with the African Civil Society for the Information Society. And we would like to hear from you, Aisha, about the situation on the African continent, first setting the scene, and then later on we will also talk about what solutions you are looking for or trying to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Good morning, participant. Thank you for being here. Actually, I cannot, I cannot add more than uh, um, than uh, the, uh, the other speakers are just going to uh, provide you with the African context. Actually, I owe my uh, statistics to uh, UNICEF, to uh, IWF, to We Protect and ECPAT. Um, One forty-seven million user is the number of internet users only in uh, West Africa, most of, most of whom are children. And uh, in Africa, children are among the most active internet users, whether using mobile phone, uh, tabs, or, or, any, uh, or a computer. Actually, 84% of them go online with either one of the devices I've previously said. However, children are unfortunately uh, subject to a number of threats, uh, like phishing or uh, cyberbullying, and most common threat is um, the sexual abuse. For instance, um, um, many growing number of African states are suffering from sexual abuse or exposure to uh, inappro inappropriate uh, content like porn. Um, Namibia, for instance, in Namibia we have 29% of Namibian children reporting seeing images of sexual abuse online that they do not wish to see. One of the key issues in Namibia of online exploitation has to do with also with peer-to-peer -peer abuse and revenge porn arising, which is arising more likely because of the growing access of kids to, to internet, which is uh, counting 93% of Namibian children have access to internet. Moving to Uganda, the situation is now uh, different. Uh, internet in Uganda, internet access has grown, has grown by 45% over the last decade, which allows more children to go online. Uh, they have uh, recorded 
that the helpline started or increased from 10 calls a day to 750 calls of um, sexual abuse reported. In 2007, National Center of Missing and Exploited Children reported that 700% uh, sorry, increase in the number of industry referrals of ch child sex abuse material online between 2013 and 2017. The Internet Watch Foundation, 55% of children report that 55% of children were assessed as under the age of 10 and 2% were assessed as 0 to 2 years, years old. Moving to the South African context, according to the South African Police Service, over 19,000 cases of sexual abuse were reported to the police between 2013 and 2014 on the average of 51 cases a day. Another threat in which, um, in which African states suffer from is the, uh, the gaming or the uh, suicide attempts and the number of deaths, especially marked in Tunisia, which has to face in 2016 the Blue Whale Challenge, which is a game invented by Russians, and which, well, which went viral and caused the deaths of 150 around the world, including uh, three or four cases, or death cases in Tunisia. Um, the threats in uh, Africa, we may go to the causes of these threats, and um, they may be caused mainly by the ignorance of lack, or let's say the lack of education of kids, the lack of education of the parents of kids, and also the lack of education or awareness among civil society organizations and the government about the risk and the danger of um, the kids going online without being controlled by their parents or the local uh, authorities. So uh, that's, why, uh, that's, uh, that's for me now, Judah. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for giving us uh, a, a short glimpse on the situation in uh, several African countries. Uh, first, I would like to turn to Paul. For do we have any? He is our online moderator. Do we have any questions from? No questions so far. No, no questions so far. So um, we have a f question from the floor. Larry, would you? There have yeah. been many articles written, including some by myself, mm -hmm. saying that that's a myth, that there is no proof that that game is anything other than Russian fake news. So I'm curious where you got your data from that 150 people died. That's, th that's about 149 more than I've ever heard, maybe even 150 more. Okay, uh, so I'm uh, actually Tunisian, so I live in Tunisian state. And we have witnessed three suicides with kids. I'm actually a teacher too. So uh, one of my kids was a uh, victim of blue whale. So I can tell you this is not a rumor and this is the truth. And we had to um, issue a court decision to uh, ban this uh, game from being uploaded in our country. Scholars who have published articles saying that it is a myth. Now it may be a self-fulfilling prophecy in that a myth was created and other people acted it out but it actually has been documented to have begun as a Russian fake news story that may have morphed into reality in certain countries, but it's been very controversial. There have been many articles written about it, so I'm just, it's just an interesting issue that I'm not questioning the accuracy of what you're saying, but I am saying there's been a huge a number of art people who have questioned whether it's in fact true. I, I do think at, at this point of time we can let this stand as an example of that there are challenges that are uh, c children are confronted with. It, it might not be the blue whale, we don't know whether it's a myth or not, but there are other challenges that children are trying that they learn from via the internet, but mainly we would like to focus today on child sexual exploitation. That's uh, the topic of this session. And uh, now that we've heard that we have different situations in, in different countries around the world, although this is a worldwide issue, in all the countries. Uh, the We Protect Global Alliance have developed the global national response and it's in the, the term itself that it's 
a global response, but that needs to be adjusted to the nas national situation to achieve really results. Uh, Anjan, could you explain a little bit more about the global national response model? Uh, thank you, Jutta. Yes, as, as I was explaining earlier, uh, one of the concrete outcome that came out of the We Protect uh, initiative was uh, the model national response uh, and uh, a strategy guidance um, that helps the, the, the member states to really understand what it is and how to implement it. And uh, as UNICEF, we had been supporting um, the country offices who work very closely with the government to, to implement it at the national level. And as I said, uh, we are launching uh, this brochure today, uh, which is the first time ever we have really uh, mapped out um, some of the, the highlights, some of the activities that had happened at a country level uh, to portray uh, the responses that the countries are putting. And it's not only countries. Um, I have uh, my colleague from the fund unit here. So one of the other um, uh, output of the We Protect was the formation of uh, a fund to end violence, the purpose of which uh, is to support uh, initiatives, so whether it's member states uh, or you know some uh, pilot projects um, led by um, non-government organizations at different countries uh, to kickstart this process. One of the key challenge uh, that we find for many member states is to really understand uh, where to start from. And uh, you know, even though the motivation is there, uh, there is um, you know really lack of guidance uh, as to where do we invest and where do we get this process started. So in that respect, the model national response gives very clear 21 different capabilities, which um, and which target six different categories, starting from you know uh, the national leadership that's required. It emphasizes on the need for having very core, clear understanding among the, the policy makers, having the, the legal structure in place, uh, having the, the right capacity and the tools and technology for the law enforcement to do the investigation. Um, very clear guidelines on what should be done for the victims in terms of identifying them, in terms of bringing them back to, you know, reintegrating them, providing the care and support services, having the child protection systems work, so between referrals, what Susie was explaining and the work that the IWF does, is to have a hotline, a reporting hotline in place in all countries so that we can get uh, these offenses, you know, information about these offenses and then refer to the police industry engagement in terms of removing the content, public awareness. So I, I'm not going to go through all the different 21 capabilities because of lack of time. You can all uh, read through the brochure. It really tells you what are the different capabilities the government need to have in place. And the purpose of the We Protect is to provide that support. So if a country has signed up to the We Protect, um, automatically they're entitled to seek support and guidance in because the we feel as a, as a network, as an alliance, uh, we need to share and distribute the information, you know. So uh, not all member states are in the same situation uh, in terms of knowledge and understanding and resources to tackle with the issue. So uh, uh, as a global initiative, we, and we, I think from what we have said earlier, we all understand that it's very difficult to fight this um, problem alone as a single isolated you know, initiative. So the beauty of this uh, We Protect is to provide that collective wealth of knowledge that has been amassed over the period of time and it's, it's an ongoing process. So uh, if that answers your question, right? Yes, exactly, Anjan. So it gives me the opportunity to turn to Sisi Khan on your left, uh, who comes also from the African Civil Society for uh, information society and probably you can tell us a little bit about how the situation is in the African countries. We know it's really a challenge to set up a hotline, for example, to have law enforcement trained to deal with these crimes and these, these cases. And Sissi, could you help us understand the situation on the African continent? Thank you, Jutta. It's my pleasure to be here with you as a president of the African Civil Society on the Information Society. Um, it's a platform of uh, 600 NGOs uh, around the 
continent and uh, the African diaspora. And uh, we were launched in the framework of the VCs. So we are following very closely all the actions. And uh, uh, from our side, we include uh, this issue and the issue of uh, a broader issue of the bad use of internet and uh, the information society in general. And we command uh, the action you are, uh, the, um, you are uh, taking. And I think uh, it's a common problem to the whole and the global humanity. It's about our children. It's about our future. And it's important that we um, orient them to the good and fair use of the internet. That was the, the spirit of the VCs. And uh, what we see now is really uh, frightening because of uh, all the threats. We heard yesterday about the Paris Decla Declaration. And I think uh, the We Protect Global Alliance goes in the same direction. It protects ourselves, protects the humanity. Because if we protect our children, we protect the humanity. Uh, regarding Africa, uh, the issue in general is that it, it is not, uh, uh, to be honest, it is not considered as a priority because uh, 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 first uh, the, the issue of access is still pending. We have an average of 20% internet access, so we have a big uh, potential of growth. And uh, also um, the, the priorities are in other issues, and uh, you know it's a uh, emerging continent with lots of uh, challenges, uh, wars and uh, refugees and uh, sometimes uh, food and, uh, and uh, employment. So um, that means that uh, the, the focus of the main uh, governments is not uh, about ch child uh, protection, although it's, it's, a, it's a critical issue. And uh, we missed uh, to organize together a session in Mexico because I couldn't, could not uh, attend. But I'm following very closely, and uh, we are happy to accompany it. Just to tell you that um, the issue of ICT in general is uh, really handled uh, in, in, in a big, big, big uh, percentage by the civil society organizations, because uh, precisely it's not a, it's always a priority, although it is very important. And um, uh, the issue of child protection and uh, is uh, something. Uh, deal, deals with uh, really with sensitization and education, not only of the children but also the parents. And uh, my organization, uh, through our networks, we are doing uh, tremendous work on the ground. So you can uh, find uh, throughout uh, civil society organizations in Africa a uh, wide range of uh, human resources talking and speaking uh, local languages. Because the issue, if, if I, I go to the in deep issue, we always refer to uh, the taxes of the VCs. We need inclusion. We need local contents. We need to, to, Im, uh, to imply the, the, the people to speak their languages, to make, um, to make uh, them understanding what's going on. Most of them, they don't even know about that if you go to the internet, you are you are pisted, you are recorded. And, uh, sometimes you see uh, this uh, software talking to you, but it's behind. There is a camera, and uh, you know that uh, the social medias are just driving people, many people, to the fun, the, the, the funny aspect, and the mm, people aspect of the internet, and this needs to be more dealt with uh, in terms of uh, sensitization and in terms of uh, um, training and information. And you can rely on, uh, on my network. We are Africans and we are uh, speaking, uh, we are very, very well educated people in general in the, in the network. And we are speaking local languages. And you need to rely on this. And uh, that's what, what, wh why the system is not working in Africa. It's because many of the time, people, they go to the governments. And governments it doesn't see it as a priority. So and in general, I, I commend what you are doing. And I think um, it's uh, all the network is following it. But uh, these are really the, 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 the points I see as uh, potential solutions. And uh, 
I congratulate you and uh, also what you have said about uh, the, the network. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, CC. Before I hand over to our technical expert on the panel, uh, Amdan has a response to give to exactly what you've said. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. And I completely agree with what you said. I just wanted to illustrate that some of the African countries are really coming on board and even the implementation of the model national response, I would name Namibia, for example. I mean, there are, Uganda is also doing well. In, if you look at uh, Zambia just launched the hotline uh, with IWF. Um, what we mean to say is that yes, there are challenges. Uh, there will be challenges of resource, of technology, um, of political will, but we have examples. And um, countries like Namibia has established national, you know, um, at the highest level, um, intersectoral uh, collaborative uh, body uh, to guide the process. So there are good examples coming up. Thank you for explaining that and done to, to us all. Um, so while the We Protect Global Alliance is uh, an, a strategy, a policy strategy, we also have uh, technical solutions or attempts to solve the problem with the help of technology. And I, I would like to invite uh, Frederick Hansen, he's a security expert sitting also to my left, to explain a little bit from your experience. What can technology, technology do in this regard? Thank you. Thank you, and um, yeah, I'm on, on board with this as a um, private security guy from the private sector. And I did my journey into the rabbit hole uh, by examining what I would call the dark web uh, to get a clear picture of the spread. And since you may be aware that the open web where you're browsing, where Google indexes things, that's a totally different arena where the dark web is the hidden services on the network. Um, my conclusions from the research done so far, which uh, to be said, it's never going to end. It's, it's a cycle. This thing could be researched for too, too many years, sadly. Um, on the dark web, there are sites with menus today. I don't have to go into much details about the content of the menus, but it's scary. It's pictures of different people. Yeah, yeah, will do. Yeah, um, so it's a scary thing to see actually. And another fact is that these guys are actually today teaming up. So they are collaborating uh, in providing pictures, selling pictures, things like that which is, yeah, I was going to say it, it makes me lose hope on mankind, but still. There are some good things coming up to that. Um, going to the proactive part, awareness is always key. And there are great initiatives um, among lots of different organizations. And one of these are Google, which have started something called Interland, uh, Be Internet Awesome, which targets kids, teachers, parents, and they have games which turns the kids to prepare them for internet, to make them more um, experienced when it comes to phishing attacks, things like that, which most grown-ups today are falling for. That would be to save the next generation. So that's that's a key thing to, to be proactive in the long term, actually. And <coughs> on top of that, apart from teaching the next generation to be more safe online, I would just like to add that the, 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 the value of the portals being deployed today, uh, where you can, can um, uh, report pictures, that work needs to be continued and expanded and also the developments using file hashes, uh, tagging images that can be reported and handled, and, and um, having Google, Facebook, Twitter, big organizations like that stepping up and supporting, that's a key thing forward, as well as um, scaling up using different bots that will hunt down images in a quicker pace to offload the analysts, 
and then of course emerging technologies like uh, like uh, AI would be a beneficial thing as well and um, on top of that I'm seeing like helping the national poli police forces with knowledge on legal aspects as well um, so it spans over different areas this whole thing but it's it's um, yeah really really important work thank you thank you frederick so you you have given us a slight insight into what technology can do i remember that Facebook announced, I do think two weeks ago, they had removed 8.7 billion pieces of content during three months only. So only three months, 8.7 million uh, pieces of content. And 99% of this content infringing their community standards were discovered by artificial intelligence. Only 1% came back to reports from people. On the other hand, we know that many people report to hotlines like the Internet Watch Foundation. So, Susie, can you elaborate a little bit more on the one hand about the reports you receive and also uh, Frederick has mentioned the darknet as one area. We know that these images not only surface in the darknet, they are there also in the open and free Internet. And can you also elabor elaborate on that aspect? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, um, so in terms of the content we see, we receive reports from the public and we also proactively search for content using our crawlers. But we crawl the dark web and we crawl the open web as well. Um, it's a myth that all this content is on the dark web. It's, it's not true. Um, there is a lot of very, very bad content on the dark web. And obviously as technology develops, it presents increasing challenges for us in terms of how we might be able to tackle that. But the majority of the content we see is on the open web. And a lot of the content we see on the dark web is actually hosted on image hosting boards on the open web. And we are able to go into the dark web. We can't, if it's, uh, and we, if we can, uh, if we locate the images, we're then able to hash them. So we're able to put a digital fingerprint on the images, add them to our hash list. We currently have 330,000 unique images on our hash list which is then used to crawl the internet and also by technology companies to ensure these images and duplicates aren't uploaded in the first place. Um, we obviously are using uh, artificial intelligence and constantly working with technology companies to do that, to try and tackle the volume because it's, it's terrible. But I would also say that there isn't any technology in the world that can currently accurately age a child. And there is no technology in the world that can do the job of human assessment. So regardless of how much content we find that's potentially child sexual abuse, we require two analysts to actually humanly assess that content to ensure that it is child sexual abuse content and that we can get it taken down. So um, it, it's, I'm not saying we've got it uh, sorted and it's incredibly challenging for us, some of the things that Frederick was talking about. But it's also really important that you see it in the overall context of where all this content is. And most people access child sexual abuse for the first time on the open web. And when, find my final point is when people say to me, well, it, what are you doing? Because it's all on the dark web. And I say, well, really? That's why we've got 20 people sitting in an office every single day removing hundreds, millions of images off the open web. So it is on the dark web. It is challenging, but it's also out on the open web as well. Okay, thank you. Because uh, before we go to our final speaker, I would just look into the floor whether we have any comments so far. Yes, please. Go ahead. Good morning. A um, question for Susie Hargraves. Do the uh, figures that you notice on... Sorry, my name is Christelle de Pilly. I'm um, living... I live here in Paris. Um, the, que the number of photos and content that you find, does that match if there is any statistics from law enforcement in terms of numbers? So, um, as I said before, nobody knows exactly how many images, and obviously more images are coming online all the time. Um, one, uh, an example of the, a challenge is that in the States, uh, if you're a, a survivor, a rescued victim, you can opt in to be notified if your images are found on someone's computer. One young woman I talked to, one of her images had been shared over 70,000 pounds, and she'd had uh, 70,000 times 
and she'd had 1,500 notifications of people having that image. So, you know, the duplicates are a huge issue. So no one knows exactly how many images there are. Um, and there are two, the two sets of statistics which people get really mixed up. One is the number of offenders and the other is the number of images. So in the UK, we know that there's between 80,000 and 100,000 people at any one time looking at child sexual abuse images. And then there's no reason to suppose that people are any different or worse in the UK. So those numbers may well be mirrored you know, <laughs> around the world. So the sheer numbers of people looking at it. We're dealing with the supply side, but we actually have to deal with the prevent side as well. So um, you know, one of the things we're trying to do increasingly is connect up so use our technology so we're trying to develop data sharing agreements with the other hotlines so that we're not all duplicating the work we're, it's quite frustrating in terms of GDPR for us but actually you know you know actually we need to share all this intelligence so that we can build up a better picture and that's exactly what we protect is trying to do actually so that we're not all saying different things to different people so I'm um, sadly the answer is no we can't give you exact correlation between what we see and what law enforcement sees. Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Just uh, for information sharing about Africa, to build on um, some of the information that was mentioned. Um, sorry, my name is Marie-Laure Lemineur from ECPA International. Uh, the African Union has actually got a large grant and is implementing um, <coughs> A, a project at regional and sub-regional level on online child sexual exploitation. One of the deliverable is a re, re, I mean an assessment against the MNR capabilities, the 21 capabilities at country level, but it will be a regional report. And you're absolutely right when you said that um, what we found working and partnering with them is that there is a need to educate policy makers uh, because clearly there are competing priorities, number one, and of course, you know, um, uh, those countries are facing uh, very difficult circumstances and, and maybe this topic is not a priority on their policy agenda but when they are when it is a, a, a topic uh, they just you know they just don't really understand the dynamics of exploitation of abuse um, all that is going on and the trends technology trends etc so there is a need clearly to before going on the ground and do field work to educate policy makers so that they themselves are decision makers so that they can take um, at the time of taking decisions they are informed decision makers and policy makers thank you thank you Marie law for for setting that clear um, I was just reminded that uh, we have statistics from the Association of Hotlines from InHope around the world who collect the, the figures and probably someone from InHope might step in here and give us some more information. Uh, Ada, could you give our to, to the question? And the question was, is there a correlation between the uh, databases of the police and what we see at the hotline, right? Yes, number of... Um, reported or estimated uh, cases of victims versus the number, what's the, well, you gave a virality number, unfortunately, uh, on the form of an example, but yes, well, the number of cases of abuse or you know, victims versus the uses of images. Yeah, okay, so if, if I would draw the picture around that, um, there's uh, several things you can say. Um, the far majority of the material which is uh, on the internet, on the open internet, is material what comes up, popping up from the dark web. So that's most of the time already known victims uh, at, for police forces, but it doesn't mean that it are, are solved cases. So uh, the hotline, uh, the hotlines which are um, connected to InHope, a member of InHope, uh, put this material into a database which is then matched with the ICSA database of in, uh, Interpol. And Interpol does uh, find new victims or clues to, to rescue victims and find perpetrators. Uh, a couple of hundred a year, actually. So the hotlines are contributing to solve cases of um, abuse in that way. It's hard to say, if you look at the Dutch database, the Dutch police had a database of 1.3 million hashes, which is a completely different a number than what IWF hash has. But then the police database is a victim database. It's not 
a child sexual abuse material database. That means that there are child sexual abuse material in there, illegal pictures, but also pictures of victims uh, uh, in series. And a part of a series could be a legal picture and a part could not be. So it's, it's very hard to say if the two cor uh, correlate to each other. Um, however, like I think in the beginning is that we need to cooperate all together and do our part to help police finally find the victims and the perpetrators. Thank you, Arda, for stepping in here and giving out that clarification. Before it's your official turn to speak, um, I have two other voices from the floor, and then we will go to Arda, and then we have another final round of speeches and questions from the floor. Please go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Thank you. I'm Yves Goudans, working for the Federal Police, leading the child abuse team over there, and I'm also driving the European impact, uh, the CSE, 30 countries. I would like to comment on a few things I heard here. First of all, I would like to support what my uh, esteemed colleague from uh, IWS said, that human assessment stays very important. Why I'm saying that? Because for the moment, we are overflowed by information supported, given by artificial intelligence all over the world, and only 30%, an average of 30% of this information is illegal. But I have to uh, involve police officers looking at legal material, which takes a lot of time, one thing. Second thing, dark net, open net. Uh, as we see it, uh, the dark net is the start of the career of a picture. Uh, terrifying abuse of children, and in a certain time they will end up at the open internet. And then the third issue is the peer-to-peer because uh, you can fight sites, you can investigate the dark nets, but peer-to-peer -peer still has about 20, an average of 29 million illegal moves every day, which means it can be installed on your computer very easily. So there's a lot of challenge going on. And for me, one of the main efforts we must, we must do is try to uh, focus on quality information instead of quantity information because that, I can assure you, is for the moment killing police officers all over the world, fighting quantity instead of quality. Thank you. Thank you for, for this clarification. We have now one question from remote participants, so I would go to that first and then it's your turn. Paul, please. It's, working, yeah. it's a question for Susie uh, from Jim Pendergrass um, in Washington, D.C. with the Galway Strategy Group. Uh, when you discover sites in the open that are hosting this material, uh, what steps do you take to have the websites taken down? Who do you contact? And how does that process work? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so when we find content on the open web, uh, we go through a tracing procedure. We use three tracers. First of all, we assess if it's child sexual abuse under UK law. We then go through a tracing procedure. We also hash the image. Um, and then we uh, place it on our hash list. Uh, when we've traced which country it's hosted in, if it's hosted in an InHope country where there's a hotline, we go via InHope and the InHope database to notify that hotline and then they work with that country to get it removed. If there is no hotline, we work via local law enforcement, go through either CEOP in the UK and the National Crime Agency or, and via Interpol. And also we have a direct agreement with many companies, if they're members of ours, where we're able to, if they're US companies, we're able to alert them simultaneously at the same time as NECMEC in the States. We then put that content on our URL list, our blocking list, which is currently, it's about 7,000 URLs a day. It's cleaned twice a day, and that is deployed across the world by, amongst others, Google and Microsoft. And we work every single day to get that content removed. And it's a very dynamic list, about 400 URLs come off a day and go back on a day. Um, and, but unfortunately, we have some content on our list that's been on there for years that hasn't been removed and other content which will come down within seconds. If it's in the UK, we don't put it on the URL list. We work directly with the host and we typically have the content removed in under two hours. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Now, you please. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, my name is Simon Mason. I work for the National Crime Agency in the UK uh, in an organisation covering uh, CEOP command or child exploitation online protection. Um, I think when colleagues in the room uh, are able to read uh, the uh, publication that's been launched today, 
uh, few will doubt the impact of the We Protect Global Alliance and the End Violence Against Children Fund is beginning to make, uh, and I say beginning to make because I speak uh, as a senior manager with teams responsible for delivering some of this in developing countries in particular. Um, however, um, we have learnt and fully understand how long it takes to make a sustainable difference once you begin to invest time and effort in developing countries, most notably, for example, Kenya and Namibia. Um, my question, therefore, is what is the future of We Protect uh, and EVAC and the Global Alliance in the sense of how long can it sustain its own um, uh, capability to support this continued development so that the investment and time and effort being made thus far um, does not wither on the vine? Thank you for that question. I, I do think it's a perfect question to have a final round then with all the speakers. And, and I also would like to ask you for some more patience to, till we go to the final round of audience questions, participants' questions, sorry. Uh, because I would now like to turn to Ada Herkens uh, from the Netherlands, who is there uh, also responsible for the Netherlands hotline and serving as a senator on the parliament, uh, on the Dutch parliament. Uh, we have heard, uh, those of you who have listened to President Macron speaking yesterday, uh, emphasizing very much also on the need of uh, legal solutions. He was demanding for regulating the internet in a way that I've not heard for many, many times before. Um, and he, he phrased that as our common responsibility that we have to shoulder in the next years. Speaking explicitly about child pornography, terrorism, hate speech, so, Ada, what is the Dutch position in regard of this and what would you like to announce to us today? Thank you, Jutta. Um, yeah, well, the thing is, as a politician, I see many times the subject of child sexual abuse being abused uh, to enforce laws which I sometimes really doubt being effective. But let's start by saying that nobody wants child sexual abuse material on the internet, right? Maybe a few, but then again, there's a lot of child sexual abuse material around. Child sexual abuse material was actually almost gone in the 80s. Um, before the internet, we, we really learned to, to stop the flow of that uh, being very hard to get. And uh, internet made it boom enormously. Um, I would like to talk to you about what we see at the hotline because you hear, hear the terrible stories of toddlers and babies uh, and infants being abused and tortured. And of course, this is material which is out there too, but you have to realize it's much more than that. It's also children who are posing erotically or sexually. It's also self-generated content. So many young people out there send out their pictures or are being sextorted to give more pictures. So it's, it's a wide range of the material that you see and where it's coming from is also very different and it's very good to understand that. Um, now, the Netherlands is number two uh, in hosting CSAM worldwide. So we're the second biggest hotline, and that's not something I'm really proud of. Actually, I'm not proud of it at all. Uh, and we're number one in Europe. And the hosting material, and the, f the fact that we have this lot of hosting, it means that the material is found on surface based in the Netherlands. So many people tell me and ask me, oh, so you are producing a lot of, of this material. No, it's not that. We have servers, and there it's based on. And it's based on servers which are placed in the Netherlands, but could be owned by companies in, or many times they are, in another country. Um, it could be placed, and it is most of the time placed on websites which is owned by companies in other countries. Sometimes countries for us difficult to reach. Uh, sometimes countries which are easy to reach. So why is this? Um, why is this happening? Why is the Netherlands so good in this material? Um, it's not because of the production, like I said. It's because we have a really good network, something I am proud of, a uh, fast network. And we have the M6, which is the internet uh, connection point, which makes it for us possible to quickly uh, send out 
um, the data being images and videos to, uh, most of the time. So yeah, it's very popular for image hosters to host their websites in the Netherlands because they're not only hosting CSAF. Of course, they many of the times they also host pictures of holidays or food or dogs or cats, of course, yeah. Um, the problem with the fight against CSAM that is often and it's still seen as a police job. Um, we, we think of it, yeah, the police need to find the perpetrators who upload this material and then stop them doing that. Now I can tell you that our hotline uh, reviewed in 2017 156,000 URLs. That's only a URL. On a URL could be one image or could be thousands of image. So many people putting it out there, very hard to find. Actually, it's not the right way to go to stop CSM to spread. It's too much to handle for any police force and the police should actually focus on the perpetrators and the victims and find them and not you know, who is spreading it. I think we need a multi-stakeholder approach to tackle this. Um, and I'm not, I'm not agreeing with what Macron said yesterday, because the way he said it, that's risking shutting down the internet. I think that we, and I'm saying we as the technical community here, facilitated the problem, but I also think we can solve it. And one of the things are, of course, mentioned by Frederick, uh, but I think we have to look at who is responsible for the content of the internet. Now, uh, Susie just told her um, the way that uh, the IWF consensus, uh, uh, looks at the, assesses the content and takes it down. In the Netherlands, we have this uh, voluntary notice and takedown procedure, which is uh, kind of unique, I believe, in the world because we do it voluntarily, meaning that um, if uh, material is n noticed on the internet of which you think should not be there, it could be child sexual abuse material, it could be hate speech, it could be discrimination, it could be um, uh, copyright infringement. You notify the website hoster, the website or the host of the website and ask them to take it down. Um, if it's not taken down, there are actually two ways to go. Um, when it's private law, you would then go to a judge and say it needs to be taken down. Think of the copyright infringement. Of course, there are many uh, bodies who would just fine you for putting pictures out there which, are not, uh, which you haven't had consent of placing them. But if it's child sexual abuse material, then you would have to go to criminal law. And here's the problem that we have. We have one bad hoster in the Netherlands. Um, one of the reasons, actually, Susie mentioned it, uh, that a lot of material is still online. Because this hoster says, yeah, uh, I don't acknowledge the Dutch hotline because you are not a legal body, you're not a judge, you're just people who are being paid to do this job. Um, so, yeah, I'll take every material down when a court order has been issued. So that would mean that the police will need to go to the court for every URL that they have to ask them to take it down. Now, that has been done for a couple of months, but it's a lot of work. Uh, and the problem is that it's been taken down, of course, but it goes up again in a minute. And it's very hard on the criminal law to prove that this hoster is doing that intentionally. They would just say, you know, every time the police comes, I take it down, I obey the law, I'm doing nothing wrong because we have a voluntary notice and takedown agreement. Um, okay, so we've been looking at this problem, how to tackle this, and within the Ministry of Justice, we are looking at uh, the possibility of an authority. We have several authorities in the Netherlands. I think you know them in the country too. We have an, a financial, an authority on the financial markets, on the consumers' market, on gambling, on healthcare. So uh, it's like an authority who keeps track on the situation and they are very uh, strong and can be fierce and can give fierce fines. The good thing about this is that you can look beyond the criminal behavior you can have a look beyond criminal law. You don't have to prove something is wrong. You can look at the behavior and intentions of an organization. Now we've researched this to use this, maybe this body to have an authority on child sexual abuse material. Um, and it looks kind of positive. Now how would that work? It would mean that we need external uh, measures. We need objective measuring. Now the 
Technical University from Delft in the Netherlands just started a project at the hotline where they objectively measure uh, where the notifications come from, uh, excuse me, where the, the, the material comes from, so where it's hosted, uh, what the structure around this hoster is, maybe it's, it's one website with several owners or one owner having several websites, and how fast it has been taken down. So there is an objective way to measure this one, and I would actually ask, I don't think InHope is here, InHope to join this measurement because I think it's really good. We can look at the terms of conditions uh, from uh, websites and hosters. And this all together will give us an image of is this a willing or an unwilling hoster. And if an authority thinks then uh, uh, this is an unwilling hoster, then, can, uh, then they can issue a fine. And it will also strengthen the cases against criminal law because we know that when authorities in the Netherlands uh, say something about something that's going wrong, in court, it will strengthen the position of the police. So it will make the whole strain uh, stronger. My conclusion is that in the fight against CSAM, we ha need to have a zero tolerance. I think that's a no-brainer. And I think administrative law gives opportunities. And when developing the policies for your new countries around CSAM, I would really suggest that you would look into um, administrative laws because we need to strengthen the community we are all here together as a community in multi-stakeholder ap approach to fight down, uh, to fight the child sexual abuse material. And we need to strengthen the position of the community and administrative roles can be, uh, law can be uh, play a role in that. Um, we don't need to shut down the internet like I think Macron suggested. We need the right tools to fight this problem. And next to this, we really need sexual education. Thanks a lot, Ada, for your statement and also for your proposition. I, I would like to discuss this a little bit further, how this uh, authority on child sexual abuse uh, or child sexual exploitation could work for other countries as well. I do understand it's mainly related to countries where lots of content of this type are hosted, so it might not be a model for all countries, but especially for countries with big server with companies providing servers, huge servers, and uh, that could address this uh, way. So we have another 20 minutes, uh, more or less, and I have the next question from the floor. I do hope it fits in there, and then we have two other questions, and then four other questions, and then just the panel prepare, please, for a final round on how we can proceed and especially please try to focus on that. We are asked to phrase three key messages from this session. I've heard several things. I will try to summarize at the end, but please also try to focus. I've got one message from Ada already, so, uh, but please also for the panels, please remind that we need to have these key messages at the end, and please know it's your floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, since 2000, oh sorry, Rajesh Charya, President, Internet Service Provider Association of India. Since 2008, Shamal Sheikh IGF, we are discussing very strongly about this child abuse. We are in 2018, still we are into the discussion path only. We are not able to do any concrete thing. First of all, in India, there is no child pornography. We call it child sexual abuse because it's totally illegal into the India for any content related to the child sexual abuse because the pornography can be into the consent but the sexual abuse cannot be the, with the consent. And that's the reason what we treat this issue as a social abuse and the internet abuse. And we are struggling for that even in our country into Supreme Court, one case is going on for stopping of this child abuse, sexual abuse immediately. Things are, right now we are implementing the Interpol list, but my surprisingly that I am comparing this child sexual abuse with the drug abuse. And for the drug abuse, I don't know or understand any NGO or any organization has monetized this for stopping this drug abuse 
similarly stopping this child abuse also and monetizing this for this purpose is in my opinion is totally against the social cause if we are putting our effort for stopping of this child abuse or if our organization is putting any effort and if they are meeting any expenditure and to cover up that expenditure the amount should be very nominal minimal so that one isp or the tsp should be able to implement that but it is not the way into our country one of the organization by meeting the higher authorities of the government try to impose this as a uh, important or mandatory to implement this and they are charging very humongous amount per year for that uh, solution which is in my opinion is absolutely wrong because when we are implementing the interpol list so this is the it's one of the same because either we say that the interpol list is not at all acceptable and only the organization who are providing the list is acceptable i don't understand because the interpol is all over the world second thing india has got the vast rural area illiteracy is also there sometime the people are not even able to aware that some photographs or some pictures are being taken and put on their websites some ngos are taking the picture for just putting the cause but they are not taking the consent of those kids or children in my opinion that's also child sexual abuse because you are not taking the consent of the team we are discussing we should discuss about this thing and my main issue is about the monetization should not be there we should be using this as a social cause thank you thank you for your intervention and thank you also for reminding us of being careful with our language when we refer to child pornography this is only due to the case that in many, many legislation the term is still used uh, and it's not replaced by child sexual abuse imagery we prefer to use this term and uh, I do think it was uh, an initiative of three major organizations led by the Council of Europe that have developed a, um, a framework of language to be used in this area and also to avoid, avoid the, the term child pornography. Uh, so thank you for this intervention and also for what you said. So we have now, uh, I think it was you, then you, and here. And Please be brief because we have to leave the room for, for the next session, which is just to mention held by the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety, which was even founded in, in the second IGF in, in Rio de Janeiro. So we are discussing this for a really long time and we are still trying to find solutions. Please. My name is uh, Michiel Steltman, Director of the Digital Infrastructure Association Netherlands. I'm representing the data centers and the hosting companies and cloud companies that are being confronted with um, uploading of abuse, child abuse material on, on our servers and in that capacity uh, very strongly committed with our sector to, uh, to fight this, uh, this form of uh, child sexual abuse. Working together with, uh, with the Netherlands hotline and uh, what, we found, what we find in general that despite the fact that we're very proactive in, um, uh, in, in a notice, using the code of conduct notice and takedown, taking material on very fast, that the same government who calls to action to us uh, to do something about this is, uh, is frustrating and preventing the actual uh, efficiency and speed of which this, this can be done. To give you just a few, and also we get some other um, uh, let's say non-cooperation by the actors that we need to fight this problem. Let me give you two examples. Um, as Arda mentioned, we need objective information to pinpoint exactly where child abuse material is located. For that, we need the databases, we need the information from InHope uh, to, to share with TU Delft to find out where it is. That information is not being shared. You know, so that frustrates the, the, the topic of to locate and pinpoint those bad hosts and providers. The other one is that new legislation prevents us of sharing information. The new e-privacy directive, which is being put in place by the EU, um, to prevent uh, prevents us of sharing information which has IP addresses and URLs. So when that law goes through, it's no longer possible for private organizations to exchange and share data 
about the URLs and the, and the child abuse materials. And governments have, uh, have they are inclined to, 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 let's say, put that as a problem for the market rather than a problem that frustrates our private, public, and multi-stakeholder co cooperation. So my question is, how we, can we call governments to actions to realize that if they're serious about fighting this, that A, multi-stakeholderism needs, uh, uh, requires to us to closely cooperate and share data and information, uh, and B, that governments need to realize that they shouldn't put up legislation that frustrates these kinds of, of efforts to cooperate. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, raising this point. I, I was hoping that it comes up in this session, and now it's nearly uh, at the end, but probably what some of the panelists can address the, the issue in the final round. I, I would like to take the, the three other questions from the floor and then it's up to the panelists to answer to these questions. It's now your turn, you please. But please be brief. My name is Andrei Sherbovich. I'm representing National Research University High School Economics in Moscow, Russia. Uh, and there is the uh, question on non-judicial uh, blocking of websites. Uh, the, the question is general, how to prevent distribution of materials dangerous for children, uh, like the, uh, the, the, the pornographic and ad, ad, other issues to, to prevent, to keep the children safe online without infringement of the human rights due to the non-judicial blocking. What is the general, uh, how to keep this balance between those two values in general? Do you have a simple answer to uh, advise the uh, governmental representatives in countries like Russia? Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think there is a very simple answer, and that is we are not talking about non-judicial blocking of websites. We are talking about websites that host illegal content, and so it's non judicial uh, decision. Thank you. Um, hello. So uh, my name is Irina Drexler. I work at the Council of Europe office on cybercrime in Bucharest in Romania. And uh, we recently had a talk uh, at the office about something that was mentioned at the beginning of the session, namely online child sexual exploitation via live streaming. And we have been discussing here a lot and I appreciate all the inputs from the experts and the, the, the participants about the uh, content that has been hosted on certain servers. But what about this live streaming? Uh, I asked the same question at the office and I'm curious about your experience and what can be done about uh, the live streaming because, for example, Romania is uh, the second uh, or is a champion, so to say, in uh, online ch uh, child sexual exploitation via live streaming, second after the Philippines, apparently. Uh, but in the case of uh, Skype, this is how it's done in Romania, only the logs can be in, uh, stored by Skype and only the logs can be accessed by the police. So what about the videos? What about the live streaming? What is your experience and your advice on this? And John, you would like to yeah, answer the question? Yeah. But do you want to answer the first part? Yeah. I mean, just a quick response to that. Um, I raised this issue. We had an industry event a couple of uh, one week ago in Seattle, and this was uh, the very question I raised about data retention. And currently, there is no uh, common ground to be honest, uh, in terms of the data, because of the massive amount of data it generates. Um, there are efforts, I wouldn't name the sites now, but there are efforts where people are monitoring, so basically taking snapshots of uh, the streams at regular interval uh, when they're informed, but not through the, the platform providers uh, as of now, yeah. Marie-Lo, you have something to Should add? Very quickly on this point, um, to, add to what Anjan was saying, uh, this, this is a form of commercial sexu sexual exploitation, mostly. So what is happening is that there are ways of collecting evidence of this um, form of crime through financial channels, also, of documenting, because technically speaking, it's difficult to look at the encrypted uh, traffic. Okay, thank you. We now have uh, five minutes left, and I would like to ask 
all the panelists to, to summarize a little bit and focus please on the key messages that shall go out from this session. Thank you. Um, thank you, sorry, okay. Thank you very much. Um, just, I just really quickly need to say, because I know the comment about monetization was uh, about the IWF charging for our services, that the IWF is a not-for-profit organization and we believe that members pay, the internet industry needs to pay to clean up its own network. So any money we get goes into running our hotline. And the fact is in India, we're talking about the five largest ISPs, which are huge, and actually they can afford to keep their networks clean and, and they have not implemented a Supreme Court order to do so. So that was my one comment in relation to that. But in relation to this uh, wrapping up on this um, 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 session, I just wanted to revert back to We Protect. You know, fighting child sexual abuse is everybody's responsibility. So it's, it's about law, law enforcement, it's about police, it's about industry, it's about the public, it's about the, uh, uh, the civil, civil society. And we all have to step up together. And We Protect provides a framework and a support mechanism for countries, whoever they are, wherever they are, however big, however small, however many people are accessing the internet to be able to do that because collectively it doesn't matter if we're great in one country at removing child sexual abuse. Unless every country steps up and all the players step up, we won't be able to resolve the problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I would also start by acknowledging uh, the, the intervention from our colleagues in UK. And thank you for noting that the Way Protect had been instrumental in kicking some of these. In terms of the sustainability, I think at the end of the day, and I will put it in a different context, you know, it's a supply demand issue. And when we talk about the demand, it's, uh, it's not related to the, I mean, the internet has fueled and has helped in the distribution, maybe it's some form of abuse, so like online grooming and live streaming. But at the very core, if you look at the social dimension, the sexual abuse of a child is that happens in the society within the family and to address that uh, we need to have a holistic plan uh, by the government ownership you know in terms of addressing sexual violence against children right so it's not a special uh, ad hoc patching problem it has to be dealt with from the roots and uh, you know the very essence of uh, empowering children uh, unless we have the holistic model that the modern national response dictates and it's a very um, you know it's a descriptive model it's not a prescriptive one that you have to have all of that so the countries do not have excuse for not coming on board so the message here is to have ownership to identify where you can start where you can invest and apply the model as you see fit and increment it, you know, in, in a regular increment, you build up your capacity. So my message would be to encourage other countries on you know, to come on board, sign the um, We Protect a statement and, um, you know, uh, to, show, to um, show some ownership on, on this issue. And I would just mention that we have copies of these uh, here. So when you leave, feel free to grab one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are all moving to, towards digital transformation. It's, uh, we cannot go back, so it's a reality. We have to take it into account. Um, we also need uh, uh, really to take into account local context. You cannot uh, deal with uh, uh, online protection only by coming and talking to governments and putting laws. It's, you are talking about sexuality, Every country has its own realities uh, regarding to ad and addressing sexual issues. That's why I repeat, you need to talk with the people. And uh, you need to talk in the language of the people, to listen to them and to know how they, uh, a hotline in, in Senegal, what is the uh, role, for example, or in Morocco, regarding the social and the cultural context. And also, uh, I call you upon to be uh, more inclusive. I see that there is only three countries from Africa. Uh, we are uh, 54 countries. And also, uh, more inclusive in terms of uh, stakeholders. You cannot deal with these things without civil society. It's, uh, it's uh, 
um, a point of view from uh, someone who is working on the ground for 25 years. And uh, I commend your action, and uh, we are uh, ready to uh, accompany this wonderful process. Thank you. Thank you, Shuta. So as a Pan-African Association, we think that, and we believe that uh, multi-stakeholders, uh, civil society, and uh, policymakers should come together to work on two levels. The first level is the education, so they must design campaigns of awareness uh, targeting parents, children, and uh, first of all, uh, officials, government officials, decision makers who need to be aware of the threats of online, uh, of kids being online. The second level would be uh, to design the appropriate, um, let's say, a procedure or strategy for African kids or for or most relevant with the African context. Thank you. I think the panel has said everything that needs to be said, so let's get to work. Yeah, um, I think Indeed, the EDPR is a, a great risk, so anybody from the European Commission or around Europe here, please look into that. It's also uh, blocking us the use of hash listings, uh, listing and stuff like that, so something we definitely don't want. Uh, concerning to Africa, I really do, would like to say again, it's been said here before, that sexual and digital education is the key, and I think the SDGs here can play an active role in that, so I would, would, would call upon that too. But not only that, we really need to educate the men who uh, view those, uh, these images. Um, we, we don't talk about that. We don't want to talk about that. But please realize that the far majority of these men watching those images are just not pedophiles. They don't have sexual feelings for children, although we think there is. It's not. They just are looking for extreme material. They, they need um, to be aroused with different material than the porn industry is offering them. So, um, and we might want to do that in, in their own language. I, I really agree on that. But we have to look into that because stop viewing is ending the demand and ending the demand is ending the abuse. Thank you so much for your final statement, Ada, reminding us that also we have to look on that side of the coin. I would like to thank all of you for staying with us for this session, for the very valuable input you gave to the discussion. And it, I would also like to take the opportunity to invite you to stay in the room because in seven minutes we will start the session of the Dyma Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. We will there look into another aspect of children's safety being infringed uh, on the internet, on technical aspects, on services provided to children. So please, if you're interested, stay here. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.